What I'd like to do is uh, walk through a couple of things we promised for this workshop. One of them is a little bit more detail, and I won't dwell on them, but give you resources, because Mike and uh, Martin Kupinger and, and uh, Jörg Resch said, let's talk about how do you kickstart compliance with GDPR coming. So some of it Antonio has provided in terms of uh, the work underway in ISO and some resources. Um, I have a list that Gail Magnuson developed, I'll walk through and it'll be available in the slides that you'll be able to download so you can access these resources. The reason uh, we provide it this way is because I don't believe any of us think there's one solution to delivering privacy. I think many organizations will make a conscious decision to comply in a, um, a I won't say superficial manner, they'll do the letter of the law and they're willing to accept residual risk in terms of potential fines or residual risk in terms of reputational problems and so on, Don talked about brand. They'll take those risks because it's such a complex animal to deal with. What we're coming at it in Oasis and many of our colleagues in the standards bodies, I think from an engineering perspective is if you wish to really implement privacy, there are ways to begin doing it. The tools may not all be in place yet, but we have a methodology to allow you to do that. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So a little bit of a, a little overview of some of these things I've discussed, and then I'm gonna move into a description of the PIMRIM, which will lead into the uh, uh, work that uh, Gershon and CJ will talk about. Um, we do believe that we've been using Stone Age tools. I think if you look at the history of system security, for the last 25 or 30 years and moving from mainframe security and so on, physical security, data centers, and now you're moving into uh, cyber security. It's been an evolution of uh, risk management, an evolution of threats, an, ev an evolution of vulnerabilities. And the world we're moving into with IoT, smart devices of all types. I, I just bought an electric car and, uh, in, in the US and you know, one of the things that the car dealer asked me to do was immediately agree to have the data sent to my insurance company from the vehicle so that they could monitor the vehicle's performance. And I said, no. But how do I know that it's not happening anyway? You see what I'm saying? There's no management control on my end of that. So, but yet, this is happening. If you buy any electric vehicle, a lot of data is being gathered and collected, and where is it being sent? So we're moving into a new age of uh, capability, but also uh, we're moving into um, uh, an age where we don't necessarily have the ability to manage the flows of personal information and, and, and some of the risks around that. So we, th we think that there's a need for a privacy engineering discipline and a privacy engineer, you know, you can move from the policy level, but at some point you have to deliver it. Now, some companies may decide they don't care to know all these dirty details, and they're quite willing to have their cloud provider assure them that the privacy uh, of the uh, data subject is being addressed. I'm not sure the GDPR really allows that, but some will make that decision. We're moving in the other direction. It's, it's not going to be easy, but we think it should be possible to do. Um, we, we use the ISO IEC 15288, it's a definition of a system, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a collection or combination of interacting elements organized to achieve one or more stated purposes. This was our core baseline which said we're dealing with systems and they're complex, they include regulatory policies, business policies, laws, business uh, uh, technical implementations, networked data flows, Etc. You add on security controls, you add on other types of controls, and you have to audit and monitor and so on. So it's kind of complex. And we, we take the approach that you must build it in functionally into your systems if you're going to achieve um, privacy delivery. And this has been a long-standing mantra of the security community. You build it in, you don't bolt it on. If you remember the, the things we've talked about for the last 15, 20 years, you must build system security into your systems and applications, and it's the same thing with privacy. Um, I mistakenly alluded to this earlier, but I was surprised that NIST, um, 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 they have an SP-800-160 system security engineering uh, considerations for a multidisciplinary approach in the engineering of trustworthy uh, 
secure systems. And the, it's a project mission statement, and it's to begin building a discipline for system security engineering. And I, in my mind, I had always thought, well, we had such a discipline. But I think what they're after, which is really interesting and very important, is to create a kind of an environment, a disciplinary environment, a set of practices, and a whole uh, uh, engineering uh, discipline which pulls together all the components we think of, of system security today. And uh, it becomes training programs, um, um, a discipline for study, a uh, demonstration of principles, concepts, and activities, and so on. And I think what we're arguing for a little bit is the same approach to data, data protection, uh, privacy engineering discipline, which takes some of these same concepts but applies it to uh, data privacy. So um, a disciplined approach from beginning to end, oversight of details, uh, perhaps automated tools to help you manage the complexity of your privacy implementations and functionality. A key feature of this, this approach would be subject matter experts, their disciplines and their tools. Because you can have, as I said in my earlier overview, um, a privacy engineer at a very abstract high level who can bring together all the necessary disciplines to deliver functional privacy in a complex system, or even a simple system for that matter. But cannot, cannot necessarily do that without many of the disciplines. A very good example, or example would be um, the uh, uh, controls that are associated with data quality might be the purview of a, a DBA, someone who's expert in, let's say, an Oracle DBMS or another company's uh, data management system, or somebody who does coding and, and can build reliable and trusted code to address privacy requirements that are not necessarily security requirements. So these disciplines may not be in the kit bag of the um, over the high level privacy engineer for an enterprise or consultancy, but that engineer would turn to these subsidiary disciplines to make sure the code is correctly written, it performs properly, and that I think Antonio was alluding to this that you've you've You've, you've taken your requirements and taken them to the appropriate level of the supplier, the consultancy, or the cloud provider, and make sure they understand them and can build them into their systems. So, so we're looking at this sort of community effort, starting with the uh, regulators and the regulations moving to the privacy officer, et cetera, right down to the level of detail. And this is where the privacy engineer can help orchestrate the collection of these uh, stakeholders and these practitioners to bring together a workable, compliant, effective, and trustworthy uh, privacy system. So um, there's an integration role for the privacy engineer, the, uh, the necessity to capture detail, the ability to update this iterative process that Antonio uh, talked about is really key because it, it, whether you're trying to talk about a traditional uh, software development environment, uh, the old, you know, the waterfall or the, a very structured um, engineering environment, and now you're into agile and user stories and, and meetings, you, whatever methodology you use, you, you will be updating and changing because you don't have the static, you know, traditional approach anymore. Things are very dynamic, dynamic and things are changing very quickly. So you must be able to update, iterate, check, and, and uh, in today's environment, we may even change cloud providers. You have to be able to, to uh, assess whether or not the functionality is, is being delivered, and this is another role for the engineer. Um, demonstration of how mechanisms meet control requirements. As I read the GDPR buried in one of the articles is a, is a statement that there's got to be a, a demonstration that the system, as I read the uh, article, I'm not the legal expert, so I can't remember which one, but uh, I have my copy here so I can turn to it later, but uh, the systems have to execute. You, you can say that they're compliant, you can certify that your organization uh, meets these requirements, but are the systems properly executed? Um, so there's an accountability role as, as uh, and the knowledge of standards, the last uh, standards assist in reducing risks. And to the degree to which you can uh, turn to uh, uh, standards and, and get them adopted widely so that your suppliers and the technology products you're using integrate to them, that's very important. And that's another potential value of having a privacy engineering discipline. It moves you out of the Stone Age world into a uh, 
new world. I wanted to give you a, a very quick overview. Uh, thank Gail Magnuson and our committee who did a survey, uh, and it's online. Um, um, the, the link is there, but you can go to our PIMRIM technical committee page uh, under privacy and identity on the OASIS website, and you can go look at our documents, and you can look at email exchanges, et cetera. It's a very open process. Uh, and um, it's supported by membership. And one of our goals is to see if there are any of you here today who are intrigued enough to consider an individual membership or have your company join us in this effort. But uh, it is a very open uh, process. I'm going to move through this quickly. I just wanted to say this is going to be available for downloading for you. These are resources. Uh, the PIMRIM, of course, uh, it's a pretty good read because we built into it um, the uh, running use case, uh, which uh, we think, you know, as we move through each of the PIMRIM tasks, it's a methodology as well as a model, I'll explain that. We have an example of each, which, which at least helps put it in some context, make it practical. Don mentioned the um, OASIS uh, Privacy by Design for Software Engineers, Documentation for Software Engineers Technical Committee. And uh, it has a specification in an annex. It's pretty good, too, because it says if you're a software uh, engineer, you're a developer, and you're expected uh, to demonstrate that you've built privacy into a system, what, document, what collection of information do you need to have in order to understand what you're developing from a privacy perspective and to document that? And it's pretty good. It's based on the PIMRIM, and they have an annex which explains it in more detail. The work that Antonio is doing, which he's talked about, um, uh, 27550, will be very important once it's uh, available. Um, some other things, um, documents you can get on Amazon, uh, man, uh, Privacy Engineers Manifesto from uh, Policy to Code, Identity, Fox, and Finneran, um, uh, uh, Jeffrey Ritter's Achieving Digital Trust, Again, resources that you might be interested in. Uh, he has a patent on trustworthiness, a tool and methodology. Uh, it's an open patent from what I understand. Um, but uh, again, these are, over, these are uh, resources. Antonio mentioned Linden, the threat analysis, privacy threat analysis. We've talked about the NISTER 8062, the privacy engineering framework from MITRE. These are all available online. Um, the, uh, the last portion of today's workshop, we're talking about this uh, open source privacy management tool that we're planning to announce today, actually, and give you some initial views of. We're looking for contributors to that uh, through the open source. Uh, it's a GitHub-based repository that Oasis manages, and we're going to talk about that in the last segment of this workshop. Uh, companies are doing work. Nimity, OneTrust. Prefender, which is an Israeli-based company, has a res uh, also um, uh, uh, headquarters in San Francisco, U.S., d have tools that deal with mapping of data, and that's one of the, the PIMRIM um, methodology includes a very heavy emphasis on visualization, that how do you map the flows of data, and what are you connecting the data to, and so on, and I'll get into that in a minute. There are other contribution, contributions to privacy engineering today uh, from Gail's research. Um, the NIST work, the PREPARE, AICPA, that's the, um, the um, uh, uh, accountancy uh, profession, uh, uh, UC Berkeley School of Information, privacy patterns, there's a whole body of work there. Carnegie Mellon has a Master of Science in Information Technology, Privacy Engineering, Johns Hopkins University in, in Baltimore, a privacy engineering course taught by Jeffrey Ritter, and then uh, conferences and workshops, uh, IAPP, and of course uh, the EIC today. There's a, a range of um, sessions at EIC on, on GDPR and on privacy. So there is a lot of activity um, underway. What um, the methodologies uh, are PIMRIM, we've talked about PREPARE, there's a link to uh, the PREPARE project, which was an EU-funded initiative that Antonio talked about, um, and so on. So I say all this because there are resources available. One of the, our goals in the PIM room, in the OASIS um, work, is the recognition that um, you, you cannot deliver privacy simply by 
fiat. You have to use your community of experts and, uh, and, and technical standards and so on, and you've got to put it together. So what we focus on is not to say that you should use one company's solution for this and another. What we say is you, you have to understand the nature of your uh, privacy risks and you have to understand in detail your privacy requirements at a functional level. And then you can select the methodology that you think make, makes sense for you and you can select the kind of uh, technical implementations that make sense for you. So if you use a certain um, solution provider and uh, your enterprise makes use of this particular solution, then you need to integrate privacy into that. If it doesn't satisfy your privacy requirements, then you need to do something else. But the bottom line is you, you're driven by your own needs as a company. We're not, the PIMRIM does not advocate a specific solution or uh, approach. So to that degree, it's, um, it's not a prescriptive standard, it's, it's, a, it's a descriptive st standard methodology, it's a methodological approach. Um, so it's an analytic tool and I want to go through this because you need to understand this a little bit before um, Gershon and CJ talk about the open source repository tool. We are use case focused. We made this, uh, you know, I've been dealing with privacy. Frankly, I worked for many years for a large US federal agency before I started my private sector career. And in the old days, uh, we used uh, punch cards. And, <laughs> you know, you would take your punch cards down and everything was mainframe based and then you'd wait to get your, you know, print out back the next day. And this kind of, it was kind of sad, but that's how it was in the old days. And uh, things have changed. Uh, we don't use punch cards anymore, I guess. I guess there may be some people using punch cards. But um, the dynamics have changed dramatically. And uh, in the old days, uh, you know, privacy was fairly uh, singular. You had a data center and you had physical access controls. And frankly, how else would you get the data? You, you gave your punch cards in, you'd left them and you'd get the printout. I guess someone could steal the printouts. There were, there were a lot of uh, controls because of the limitations of technology. Those have all evaporated as we've been talking about. So you need to set boundaries around your use case. And what Gershon and CJ will talk about a little bit later in the last segment of this would be in, in their work to develop this baseline sort of code to jumpstart our open source repository project is how complex this can get. So what we say in the PIMRAM is you choose the boundaries around your use case. And from a, a PI perspective, and, and we, we fudge the distinction, PI, PII, in, in effect, you know, PI could become PII very easily, it's been demonstrated, so we kind of fudge it and say PI or PII, but basically it's the same thing as far as your analysis is concerned. Uh, you've got to support IoT, you've got to support cloud environments, you've got to support um, many cases still using mainframe environments, you've got to support devices, so all this has to be factored. You need to show linkages among the data. And I think uh, Mike talked about this for me, Antonio. You're, you're, moving, you're moving data from a device, um, you know, my iPhone, and you're moving it into uh, an app, and the app is communicating on a network, and it's going to a back-end system by some provider, and they're doing something with the data. All these linkages have to be understood if you're going to deliver privacy. And then you have data protection by design requirements, uh, across policy boundaries, because you may have different policies set in different countries or in different businesses, and they have to be reconciled. And really, it's a multiple stakeholder environment. And we account for that in the PIM room, which makes it a powerful tool, but it also makes it a complicated tool. There's a link to the PIM room. You can download it um, from Oasis and just do a search on it, and you'll, you'll find it. That's version o committee specification 02. The PIMRIM is a model and it's a methodology, and, and we use this uh, little chart basically to show that, well, I mean, it's a model, and it says every, every aspect that we, we believe we've incorporated all stakeholder perspectives in one way or the other in the PIMRIM. It's a model, so it, it deals with, uh, you know, the core concerns of 
privacy to stakeholders, various domains where pri personal information is processed, domains in terms of uh, ownership, who, who is in charge of privacy delivery in this domain, and domains in the sense of a boundary, a system boundary. This may be a technical domain. It could be a, a, a virtual domain. Uh, privacy architecture is dealt with. Mechanisms. We, we try to move down to the mechanism level, and, and I'll explain that in just a second, um, and the functional aspects that are very important. So the whole point of this is to say the PIMRIM attempts to be uh, kind of embrace the reality of data privacy and not try to simplify it to the point that it's kind of meaningless and abstract, even though this is fairly abstract. But the real heart of the PIMRIM is the methodology. And this is a, I know it's a eye chart, and, and I, I'll, I have a couple of slides in more detail. But essentially, as Antonio mentioned, it's, it's an iterative process so that it, you know, at some point you offload onto an implementation which could lead to architectures for privacy. You, you, your enterprise or a system, I have a privacy architecture. It consists of these components, technical components. And, and I can't tell you what those are because that's use case driven, but it could lead to architectures for certain types of applications in, a, in an organization. But basically, the heart of the PIMRIM is a whole set of steps, tasks, we call them, that lead from a, um, a very high level use case description down into a detailed analysis, down into the services and functionality that support your control statements, and then into the procedural and technical mechanisms supporting those services. So it basically um, d d decomposes from a, a very abstract level down into the more specific. The result is a privacy management analysis. It's, it's an output. It's, it's a document that has many, many components to it that can be used by the privacy engineer, or if you don't have one, someone can use it, or, or your multiple stakeholders can use it to look at different aspects of your uh, privacy requirements and how they are being <coughs> implemented or, or being planned to be implemented. And this chart just basically simplifies what I've just shown, but I, I think what I tried to say, the, the PIMRIM PMA can be useful for m this set of the community and others. So it could be of value to regulators, the privacy officer, the business owner who can determine the costs associated with implementing privacy in certain applications and whether or not the risks are worth it for the cost. Uh, privacy engineer generalist, this is my idea, that is, uh, I talked about it earlier, this sort of high level engineer who understands that developers are coding using a certain uh, you know, um, uh, language and that they're using certain technologies and understand that high level. The specialist who may be uh, working at the level of a DBMS or other you know, tool and who, who is actually constructing the code to build a system that operates, software engineers, risk officers, and others, architects, and so on. So all of these people, if you think about a, um, you know, a software development project, uh, how, do you, how do you do a software engineering project? Who starts it? Well, you start with the business. And you say, I need uh, a great idea to do this, um, and let's figure out how to do it. And then you work your way through whatever development methodology you use. The same applies to privacy, except it's a, it's a more uh, specific um, discipline focused on someone who understands data protection requirements. And that's where we tie a little bit into the GDPR. So let me walk you through the methodology briefly. It's complicated because privacy is complicated, so I'm not trying to simplify it, but we're trying to make it as manageable as possible. So basically, this idea is mine. Again, it's not PIMRIMS, but I see privacy engineering generalists generally having very strong roles in, in these aspects of our um, PIMRIM methodology. The PIMRIM, and I, we could have a whole seminar on the PIMRIM. I'm just giving you an overview. But you have, uh, you start out with a high level privacy use case analysis. You describe what the use case is, and it could be as simple as I'm creating an app that you know, monitors uh, your footsteps and sends the data to someone, 
you, and, and, and they record it for you. Okay. And, and when you want to see all the footsteps you've taken for the last year, you can go there to the app and we'll, it store them. And uh, I, you know, this is sort of a simple thing. It has a lot of privacy implications, but that's kind of an app. It's a simple thing. It could be very complicated. It could be a, we have a use case related to electric vehicles where the manufacturer embeds computers in the vehicle and the computers are being used to gather all types of data and they're uploading software changes and they're driving the car and they're parking it and they know where they are and there's a location issue, all kinds of stuff going on. So you need to have this high level description of the use case, you need to set some boundaries around it to make it manageable. The value of that is you can set a, a set of clustered use cases that integrate with one another. So you can, you can take a very large application and, and decompose it down to a, a, a sets of use cases that address privacy requirements. And that's the second step. Privacy requirements themselves, what are they? How do you deal with um, uh, consent? How do you deal with uh, informed notice? How do you deal with uh, the right to erasure? How do you deal with withdrawal of consent, for example? These are all things that are gonna be articulated in terms of requirements. You do impact and other assessments and so on. So that's a high level. That feeds the next step, a very detailed use case analysis, where now you need to understand the uh, domains and owners. So who are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing with the device, we're dealing with the user, and we're dealing with the app uh, provider. We may be dealing with others in the use case. So they're all different domains and they have different owners. A little bit into the GDPR concept of multiple controllers. The GDPR allows, um, understands that you may have multiple controllers and they may have multiple processors. So you get into that, risks, responsibilities, data flows and touch points, a very big deal. You need to know where the data are what they are and where they're going and what's happening to them. So we have these uh, concept of touch points and data flows. Systems and subsystems. What, what is processing the data? What, what systems are involved in it? That's part of this detailed analysis. Actors, who is acting on it, et cetera. Then you move into the PI. Okay, uh, we have some new novel concepts we felt. I'll give you an example. In a, in a use case, you may have incoming PI. Let's say, um, in, um, uh, let's say you're a, 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 an online uh, service provider and I log in and I create an account and I want your services and I give you, that's incoming PI in this use case. You may have internally generated PI. An example would be, I have an iPhone and it, it's, it's storing location information, and I turned it on. The GP, this is generating location information based on location, and it's inter generating internally. It's, it's, uh, and then it's outgoing. It may send that internally generated. It's a combination of me, the device. It's a combination of location and the app and some maybe other factors, the time. And then it's sending that PI to a another domain. That's, that is called uh, outgoing. And then you can have multiple systems where all of these flows are being documented. And that's why we have system N, system one, system N, et cetera. So we try to account for the reality today that this isn't a static, you know, I'm dealing with one company and I'm dealing with one set of data and it's all very clean. It's not clean at all. Now you get to specialists uh, a little bit more. I, it's, it's a little bit fudgy here, but I was trying to make a point and make it I couldn't figure out how to get arrows right, so I, I did what I could, but you'll get the idea. You then have operational privacy control requirements, and we have another novel approach in the PIMRAM. We say, you inherit certain requirements. It could be inherited because they're mandated by regulation, or you may be building uh, an application that uh, the policies have been set by another application that's feeding it. In other words, I'm getting data from the phone. I'm running something in the cloud. I may inherit those control requirements. My business may say to you, Mr. Cloud Provider, App Provider, you will do this. That's inherited. 
internal requirements would be requirements that are built for that specific application, for that specific system. And exported would be requirements that you push to other uh, entities who are involved in, in this use case. Remember, it's all use case based. So we try to account for that because they will flow very much, not necessarily with the data, but they have to flow to the others uh, participating as processors or co-controllers or multiple subsidiary processors. Those have to flow. Otherwise, you cannot guarantee you're going to deliver the privacy that you've required. Um, so that's why we've accounted for that. Antonio mentioned we have a set of services, and I'll explain those in a second. But what we've tried to do is uh, categorize the functionality with a with a label. So, so agreement, for example, would encompass a notice, a consent. It might also encompass some other factors associated with documentation of that agreement, et cetera. So we have, we have working definitions of it. Usage, uh, we felt, was a unique one. Usage is a property. It's a service. It's a functional set of functionality that, that uh, basically ensures, will ensure, that your controls operate as data moves through your use case. So if I send, uh, if I send data to the app, provider or the cloud, functionality there will be enforcing my rules. That is, is a set of functionality we, we call usage. It's basically a way to categorize the functionality, et cetera. Validation, uh, dealing with quality of the data. Certification is interesting. Certification we've built into it, it's, cer it's, it's a certification of the capability of the use case domain participants to enforce and deliver the functionality. It's a, so it's a way of saying, okay, I'm sending it to cloud provider B. Cloud provider B uh, incorporates these control func this control functionality, and so I can trust cloud provider B. How you do that, remember, in the PIM room is, is entirely up to you. Y you know, whether you do that by contract or you do that functionally, um, it has to be provided if it's part of your use case. So we, we, we deal with that. The enforcement is audit plus security is obvious. That's the good old fashioned, you know what, security. Interaction is interesting because interaction is a service uh, bundle of functionality that would deal with an interface, system to system interface, or it could be user data subject to system or data subject to application interface. How do you interface? This is a very applicable, we talked about consent, and we wanted to focus on consent of this workshop. That's very applicable to consent. How do you interface with the data subject in a smart city application to obtain consent? Is it through a device? Is it through a web? Ah, if it's through, uh, uh, you know, if it's through a web uh, in, in, in interaction, then how do you provide the uh, consent functionality in that web environment versus your smart phone environment? I mean, the interaction is very important, not very well talked about you know, set of functionality. And finally, individual access. Access gets into the requirement in the GDPR and elsewhere that an individual has the right to review their data that's being held and, and amended and object to it, and so on and so forth. So then the PIM room moves you from that level of abstraction down to, and remember, it's iterative, so you could actually start at a functional level and move back to that to say, do I have an agreement service? What, what, how do I manage agreement? The, the technical and, and the process functionality is the next step. You're very specific about what functionality you're providing. This is why it gets so complicated. And then your risk assessment associated with your decisions on implementation. You know, I think we're often, you, you, when, you, when you decide to do a business function using any of these technologies, you're making an initial risk assessment, you know, cost, reward, risk, and managing that risk from a privacy perspective. Focus on that. But your risk assessment has to be more than that. It has to be focused on mechanisms. If, if, a, 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 if, a, if a, a privacy uh, a piece of functionality in your system fails or is inadequately designed 
if it's not properly designed, you have a risk of a failure that could have huge consequences of the, the literal functionality that you've put into place. So there's a, there's a whole risk assessment associated with the implementation uh, as well. And then this, this is an iterative process because you may have to do multiple cycles of this to get it right, to deal with all the stakeholders. Almost in a rapid development environment, you get, you know, the privacy officer says, I don't understand the technology you're giving me, and the privacy engineer would say, well, let me explain. This is what they're doing. The services we've talked about, uh, core agreement usage, assurance services, the validation, certification, security enforcement, and the presentation and lifecycle services, interaction and access. Again, these are abstract uh, bundles of functionality. It's an, it's an enabler. It's, it's an important way to establish communications and designing and engineering a solution, but it, it, you know, they're not like um, you know, uh, normative in the sense of, you, you could come up with others, I'm sure, but you, you, know, you get the idea. So how do you move from principles to technical solutions? Uh, Mike has talked about this. You've got a lot of issues in the GDPR. I've highlighted in bold you know, accuracy, storage, limitation, integrity, confidentiality, accountability, et cetera. Uh, Article 7 talks about consent. We, we wanted to focus on consent at the workshop as an example because it's a very, it's complicated and it's not often, well, it's, it's certainly not done well at all today if you're concerned about privacy. So demonstrate that the data subject has consented. Present the request in a manner which is clearly distinguishable. We're getting into, if you think about the PIMRIM services I've talked about, we're already hitting some of those services. Data subjects have the right to withdraw. Well, how do you give the data subject the right to withdraw unless you know who they are, which means you need to identify them. Now you're dealing with security. And when assessing whether consent is freely given, account should be taken whether, among other things, the performance of a contract is conditional on consent to the processing of data that is not necessary for performance of that contract. Well, now you're back at a higher level set of assessments related to your design of the system. In other words, you're now at more of an abstract legal level vis-a-vis -vis a, uh, a absolutely functional level. So uh, we talked, I think um, Antonio or maybe it was Mike talked about the ICO, the information um, um, officer from the UK. They have very good guidance and they have guidance on consent. So one of the things we want to say at the workshop, consent is a hot topic. It's an interesting use case example, and it's something that you should look at. Think of, if, if, you got a, if you're running a business and you're getting consent from your customers, uh, or you're running a, an agency, a government agency, getting cust uh, your citizens to provide consent, are you following this set of guidelines? This is sort of a high level set of, of, of very valuable, but from a privacy engineering point of view, at what levels in a system is consent implemented and what functionality makes it happen? And that's where we are trying to address, using the PIMRIM, um, data privacy. Give, give you a tool, to, a methodology, so you can kind of dissect this and make some sense out of it, get your stakeholders together. So we have a table in the PIMRIM, which is not easy to read, but th this is a definition of each of the services, which is in the center here. And I've highlighted in red the, the primary services just off the top of my head in terms of a simple use case that are invoked if you have a consent requirement in an application. It doesn't mean that the others not in red are not important, validation so on, but, but you need to deal with agreement, which, which talks about permissions and rules. It's a um, negotiation, established new permissions. This gets into the affirmative consent process. Certification certifying that the credentials are uh, in place so that systems components are compatible and can deliver the privacy. Enforcement, it's monitoring and audit. Security, obviously, because you're dealing with consent, you need to know who they are, I'm assuming, or you want to track consent, so you have to give them the ability to withdraw. Interaction, which is that interface I talked about, and individual access. Um, so so, so the, the service functionality is at a fairly bundles of functionality at a fairly high level, consent would in imply that you, you addressed all of these, provided all of this functionality and services. Two minutes? Yeah. So, so overview, uh, privacy engineers will say that if you have an application, 
you'll, you have a complex application and you need to build con consent into it, you'd have to do a use case, follow the PIMRIM methodology, and then uh, develop the, uh, the, the functionality and, and de decide upon the functionality you need to deliver that, that consent. Uh, there's a privacy engineering, there are references in the GDPR indirectly um, implementing appropriate technical and organization measures uh, by default. So the only personal data are necessary for each purpose or process, et cetera. There's some language in there that would seem to suggest to me the, the value and importance of privacy engineering. Um, so what I want to leave you with is we have a plan, and this is sort of worth announcing it, to take the PIMRAM and to attempt to automate it in the sense that create a tool that will help you put these pieces together as part of your analysis and reuse it and have multiple stakeholders make use of it and or input into it. And um, there's the material I handed out and there's some other copies up here explains it a little bit more detail, but it's a GitHub-based system. Oasis uses it, and um, Gershon and uh, CJ will talk about the work they've been doing to get this started. Any questions? Uh, uh, yes, yes, sir. Are there any shortcuts for legacy systems? <laughs> I'm sorry. Are there any shortcuts for legacy systems? Like what you described as an end end process, I guess, for a new deployment. You've got lots of legacy state. I, I think it's. I think. Uh, I think it's the same. I, I would argue that it's still the use case approach because um, if it's a pure legacy system, I'm assuming there's some interfaces to the legacy, correct? So, what we would say in the PIM room is, you, you, you know, you can attempt to, you know, boil the ocean, or you can probably break it into smaller segment use cases. So, if you have that interface from a I'm, again, I know what the situation is, but let's say if you have a web interface to a back end that then communicates with a legacy system, you define where use case is from a privacy perspective, what you want to focus on, and then you could build chunks and then chunk it all together. That's all I would say. I think it's pretty, uh, you really have to look at each individual use case. But it would apply to that legacy as well. It also would apply to business process questions. It doesn't all have to be technology. You may have somebody in a system is key, keyboarding. I, I mean, that would be part of it as well. So.